Today we're going to be reviewing the Mazda CX-9. Now while most car reviewers would swear that the CX-9 is the funnest three-row SUV to drive, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath the CX-9 to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood where we have Mazda's 2.5 liter inline four-cylinder Sky Active engine. Now this one is a turbocharged variant. It's situated transversely for front-wheel drive. Now underneath the battery on the driver's side, we have a traditional six-speed automatic transmission. Now taking a look at the layout of some of the components under the hood. Up at the front here we have the coolant reservoir. We have our windshield washer tank here. The ECU is placed on the strut tower at this really weird angle. At the engine here the front part is the intake and the back part is the exhaust and the turbocharger. Over to the side here we have the battery, the master cylinder, the fuse box, and the air box. Now the general theme you'll find under the hood of the CX-9 is that things are very simple and easily laid out, especially for a modern turbocharged vehicle. Now we're gonna start with the air intake setup where we have cool air coming in the front here and it'll come down into this air box. It'll then get filtered out, passed by this mass airflow sensor and then into this tube towards the back of the engine. Now the back of the engine, we do have the turbocharger which is gonna use the exhaust gas flow to increase the pressure and speed of that air going into the engine through this charge pipe over here, which is then gonna head down to the air intercooler. Now from underneath that charge pipe is then going to head down into the intercooler located inside of here. It's then going to travel across to this side over here to this pipe over here coming out of the intercooler and then up. Now once the air exits the intercooler it's then going to come up here to this drive-by wire throttle body and then into this plastic intake manifold and then into the engine head to get burned. Now this big thing on top of the intake manifold is the EGR cooler which is going to recirculate exhaust gases coming off the back of the engine and bring it back into the intake to get reburned. Over here we have the valve itself and here we have the cooler and all these cooling lines that are connected to it. And just behind the EGR cooler is your exhaust pressure sensor and the MAP sensor. Now changing an air filter on a CX-9 is pretty straightforward. Just have to undo these tabs here and then just lift off the air box here and remove the air filter. I really like how this air filter box is really simple and straightforward. Just a straight off intake right into the air box. There's no extra resonators or drain tanks or weird fasteners to remove. Just simple. Now with the air box removed, it really frees up a lot of space on top of the transmission. Here you can see the air inlet pipe and down here is a better look at that charge pipe as it goes down into the air intercooler in front of the radiator. So now that we know how air flows into the engine, we'll next take a look at the fuel system. Now a low pressure pump in the tank is actually going to bring fuel up to this point over here where it will then go into this high pressure pump which is actually driven off of the exhaust camshaft on this engine here. That fuel is then going to be pressurized and then sent down over here to a fuel rail underneath the intake manifold. Now unfortunately the CX-9 is direct injection only which means that there's no port injectors located at the top of this intake manifold. It's actually buried underneath. You can see a little piece of the fuel rail buried under here with the fuel pressure sensor. Now those four injectors are going to inject directly into the combustion chamber instead of mixing with the air before going inside. Now the upside to direct injection is that you get better power and fuel economy me, but the expense is you don't have any gasoline on your intake valves, which could lead to carbon buildup. Now taking a look at the top of the CX-9's engine, we do have a plastic valve cover and it's got these four ignition coils located right on the top there for easy access to change out your spark plugs. Now this engine's pretty old school, it still takes 5W30 weight oil, most other vehicles use a thinner oil and the dipstick is located right here. Now taking a look underneath the CX-9, you can see that its underbody is completely covered up to the front half here in plastic, which is good because it will help with aerodynamics and from any salt water from splashing up accelerator accelerating corrosion, but the downside is you do have to remove some access panels in order to drain your engine coolant and your engine oil. Now the back half however is left uncovered throughout the middle here where the exhaust is, but there are covers on either side for the fuel tank. Now that plastic undercover has two access ports, one for the coolant drain and one for the oil and filter luckily. It even has a little integrated duct here to bring some cool air from underneath to cool off the underside of the engine. Now with the plastic under panel removed we have clear access to the underside of the engine and the transmission. Now looking up underneath the oil pan here you can see it's made of stamped steel there's no plastic here it does have an oil level sensor located over here the drain plug here and the oil filter which is a canister style spin-off filter over here for quick and easy oil changes now the oil pan bolts themselves are all easily accessible all the way around the only thing is I don't see an integrated oil cooler up above the oil filter like many other vehicles now a little bit hard to see underneath the intake manifold we do have this plastic thing which is an oil separator which is going to keep the oil down inside of the crankcase and then above you have your PCV valve that's going to ventilate it to the air intake. Now there's a mess of vacuum switch 
switches at the top here. One of them, of course, have to do with the purge valve for the EVAP system. The other one here controls the valve in the exhaust manifold, which is going to either speed up or slow down the airspeed going into the turbocharger so you get better control. Now the CX-9's engine, it has a double overhead cam design and it's powered off by a timing chain, which is good because you don't have to change it over the life of the engine. Now just in front of that timing chain setup is the drive belt setup down inside of here. You can see the drive belt as it goes to the alternator and the tensioner further back. Now accessing this drive belt setup is best done from down below because things are pretty tight inside of here. However, I do like that you have easy access to the alternator here if you need to swap it out and you don't have to remove the AC compressor down below like in many other front wheel drive four cylinders. Now if we take a look at the drive belt setup from underneath, we've got the crank and the AC compressor. Now accessing the AC compressor is pretty straightforward, just four bolts and it just drops right down off the block. Now if we take a look up inside of this splash guard here, this is where you would have access to the tensioner located up over there. Now looking up from underneath, you can see the water pump. Now if you do have to change that water pump out, things are pretty tight behind here in order to get to it. Now the water pump belt is a stretch type, which means that there's no tensioner on there. So the manual actually specifies that you use your brother's old shirt and you shove it inside of there. And once it's caught up inside of the pulley, you rotate this crank and it's actually gonna force the belt to peel it off of that pulley. And now we'll have a listen to the startup sound. Now looking under the hood, the oddest thing I find is the placement of the ECU on the passenger side strut tower, just tilted off to the side there. Now the battery is located over here and the fuse box is off to the side here. Everything here is nicely labeled. Next we'll take a look at the transmission on the CX-9. Now Mazda's chosen to stick with a traditional 6-speed automatic transmission, whereas most other automakers have gone with an 8-speed or a CVT. Now looking down in front, we do have a manual selector for the gear lever. We have the wire that'll go down to the valve body, and then inside of here we have the transmission cooler. Now right at the top here, easy to access, is the starter motor. It just bolts on with two bolts, and there's nothing else blocking the way. You can see we've got the transmission cooler here on the front side of the transmission. Looking just above that, we do have access to the starter motor as well from underneath pretty easy to change out over here we do have a steel oil pan and a drain plug now perhaps the best feature of this transmission is it still uses a traditional style dipstick once you undo that bolt there you can pop off this dipstick and check your fluid levels without having any fancy scan tools or overfill plugs to deal with you can also refill the fluid from here when you're changing it out now once the transmission is shifted through its six gears it's then going to transfer over to this differential over here and then go out to the front wheels however the passenger side axle has to first go through this transfer case for the all-wheel drive system now this transfer case is pretty straightforward it just takes rotational energy from the transverse direction and puts it longitudinally through this drive shaft before heading down to the back. Now servicing the transfer case is straightforward. You have a drain plug easily accessible here and a fill plug over here. Now in the back here, that drive shaft is gonna bring its power into the rear differential. But before the differential, we have this, which is the all wheel drive control system. Now inside of here, we have a set of clutches that is gonna lock up to allow some of the torque to be transferred from the drive shaft out to the rear differential and then the rear wheel. Now servicing the rear differential is straightforward. We have a drain bolt over here and further up we have a fill port. Now that differential is then gonna take its power out to these little axles here. Now these axles are pretty tiny so they're really not gonna help you much other than to hop the curb at your local golf course. Now the CX-9 has two main engine mounts, one over here on the driver's side that secures the transmission to the frame. And on this side here, we have one on the passenger side that secures the engine to the right side frame underneath this ECU. Now underneath the CX-9, we have the third engine mount which mounts the subframe to the transmission right here, the transfer case. Taking a look at the Mazda CX-9 exhaust setup, this is where things get interesting because it's Mazda doing a turbocharged Skyactiv engine. Now the exhaust manifold is mostly integrated into the head. There is a small bracket back here that's gonna integrate a valve, which is powered by this vacuum switch, in order to vary the amount of airflow going into the turbocharger as it spools up. And here's a little diagram of the exhaust manifold bracket. This is what holds the turbocharger on. You can see the lever inside of here that's gonna move back and forth with this little actuator over here. and that's going to vary the exhaust flow by allowing more air to enter the turbo. Now once that turbocharger is spooled up, it's going to help generate some flow for the intake side of the engine. But on the exhaust side, it's then going to come out this way, make a 90 degree bend down into the catalytic converter, and then another 90 degree bend this way, and then back this way into the flex pipe. And taking a look, here's that catalytic converter down underneath the turbo. 
and it going into the flex pipe. The exhaust is then going to travel down underneath the subframe to another catalytic converter, then to a mid silencer, and then out the back. Now, I think it's pretty unique that Mazda's chosen bright blue bushings to hold up its mid silencer. Now that exhaust is then going to travel down to the back here, around the rear differential, and then into the muffler. Now the CX-9 has a single inlet, dual outlet rear muffler with no fake exhaust tips. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Now one thing I find interesting is that Mazda's put this area in where you think a fog light would be, but in fact you've already installed a fog light down below inside of here. Look how tiny that fog light is, just a small little light. Now what's even funnier is when you look down inside of that bumper at the fog light module, the light fixture and wiring going to it is so huge you think that there's a big light outside there like a headlight or something. Now one thing I do like about this Mazda is they use a fully steel box in subframe, which also kind of shows the age of this vehicle. We do have a full frame at the back here that actually could continues along the side here and then even across to the front here even though despite you do have a plastic radiator support you still have this solid metal bar in front there that you could jack up your vehicle or lend it some structural integrity. Now one thing that's kind of sad to report is the sheer amount of rust underneath these Mazdas. This subframe here is completely covered up under the plastic and it's still rusting away. This vehicle is only a year old and there's a lot of surface rust everywhere across the subframe and the control arms and other suspension pieces. So if you're thinking about getting a Mazda, definitely think about getting it rust proofed as soon as you get it off of the showroom floor. Now despite all the praise handling characteristics of the CX-9 it still uses a McPherson strut front suspension so you can see we have the spring and shock absorber attached here and then it attaches to the knuckle over here at these two bolts. Now at the bottom here we have the inner and outer tie rods. We have the stabilizer link. Now this is one of those ones that have the four plastic dots here that always tend to break off and pop out on old Hondas. We do have the sway bar that runs over here to the other side. Now looking at the front suspension from underneath it's kind of sad that even at this price point, Mazda doesn't offer the use of aluminum anywhere in its suspension components. We have a stamped steel lower control arm, a stamped steel subframe, and even steel steering knuckles. I think it's time that Mazda updated this platform with the use of more aluminum in the suspension, not only to save weight, but also to help with this rusting problem. I mean, come on, you can even get Nissans now with aluminum knuckles and control arms. And here's a look at the control arm from up above. Now changing this control arm out isn't too difficult. We do have one bolt over here, and another bolt holding this bushing which is actually casted in this housing. Now depending on how long this control arm bolt is on the driver's side you might have to either raise up the transmission or drop the subframe. It's also going to be a little difficult to get a power tool to get up in there to knock it loose. At least over here on the passenger side it's a little bit more accessible with the oil pan not being so deep. Now taking a look at the suspension from underneath we have this lower ball joint. Now, it's actually pressed into this stamp steel control arm so you will need a press to change it out. However for the bearings they are a bolt-on style bearing. You can see we've got bolts over here so it's really easy to change the hubs. Now one thing you don't see on many other vehicles are these resonator dampers. It's basically one chunk of rubber or metal which adds weight and changes the resonant frequencies of these suspension components. There's also one down at the bottom here on the control arm. Overall though having a strut type front suspension is perfectly normal for any seven-seater family vehicle. It's going to be good when it comes time for maintenance. Although I would like Mazda to improve throughout the use of more aluminum as well as having a more unique suspension design to aid with handling and to go with Mazda's zoom zoom character. Now looking at the suspension from underneath, we do have this stabilizer link, just like the front. These are those ones that do pop off pretty easily, so you're going to have to replace those. Taking a look inside of here, we do have a steel knuckle once again, with a bolted on style bearing, so you don't need a press to change it out. Now the subframe and most of the suspension components are made of stamped steel underneath here. I feel like Mazda could save a lot of weight and fuel economy if they just switched over to aluminum. Now that front lower control arm has this plastic piece here, which will help with aerodynamics. One thing I don't like is the cover for the fuel tank just has this big empty section here where things can get lost or just sit there over time. Now Mazda did include this little cap here for the subframe on this side. However, what's weird is they didn't include it to cap off the rear side. Now changing suspension components on the CX-9 is pretty straightforward. You do have two nuts for the shock absorber and then one bolt down at the bottom at the knuckle over here. The spring is held on by this lower control arm which is just bolted to the knuckle at the bottom there. However, in order to change this upper control arm, you can see its bolt actually buried way up inside of there. And in order to access that bolt, you actually need to drop the subframe down which means that you need to remove the rear differential and the fuel tank and the drive shaft and the exhaust just to change this upper arm. So if you do hit a curve and manage to bend this arm, 
or these bushings wear out, good luck because you're in for a big job. Now Mazda is still stuck with an all steel design back here and one thing I really can't notice is the amount of rust on all these components here, especially for just a year old vehicle. I feel like I'm looking at a seven or eight year old vehicle after a couple of winters. Now the back here, Mazda is nice enough to give you a camber and rear toe adjustment on just the rear lower arm. It's cool that Mazda has actually painted the inside of the rim black. It also helps to hide a lot of brake dust. Next we're going to take a look at the cooling setup on the CX-9. Now things again are pretty straightforward. We have a radiator cap and a coolant jug located right behind the fan here. The radiator is located at the front here and luckily you don't have to remove the front fascia in order to access it because it will just slide right up. There's just so much room to work here. At the top here we have the upper radiator hose that goes to this plastic junction before going into this coolant inlet. Now the lower radiator hose is going to come up over here and go into this coolant inlet over here. Now inside of this plastic housing is where the thermostat is located. It's pretty easy to access once you remove this air pipe. Just a couple of bolts and it should pop right out. Now the hardest part to see is the water pump setup on the CX-9. The water pump is belt driven and it's located near the back of the engine with a separate belt that goes to the crankshaft. It's actually best accessed from down below. Now the water pump has a bypass feed that's going to bring coolant across the back of the engine over to the cooling side on the driver's side. And here's a look at that cooling fan from the behind. Just a single electric cooling fan. Now I do like how they've integrated this reservoir around the shape of the fan here. So you actually have a long straw that goes from the bottom of that reservoir all the way up here. And here's a look at that cooling fan from underneath. At least Mazda is nice enough to give you an actual petcock valve as opposed to pulling the hose out and draining the coolant. Now the upper grill has these active grill shutters that are going to open and close based on aerodynamics and cooling capacity. Now Mazda only does that on the upper part of the grill as opposed to many other manufacturers that do it on the lower part of the grill only. Next up we'll take a look at the braking setup on the CX-9 and things are pretty traditional. We have your master cylinder and its reservoir located over here and just behind it there's a traditional vacuum booster. However this being a turbocharged engine the intake does not have enough vacuum to drive drive that vacuum booster. So if you follow the line, it actually leads to this vacuum pump. Now this vacuum pump is also driven off of the exhaust camshaft, just like your direct injection pump. Now the master cylinder's lines are going to run along the firewall and instead of putting the ABS module at the back here where it's nice and safe like many other manufacturers, Mazda has chosen to put it right up at the front here behind the passenger side headlight. Now this module is going to control the traction control, stability control, and any autonomous safety features of this vehicle. Now speaking of autonomous safety features, this Mazda logo here that is almost the size of my hand is actually where the radar sensor is located at the front. Now it's a pretty good idea to keep it up here, unlike some manufacturers that put it down near the bottom here where it could be subjected to impact from chickens crossing the road. Now taking a look at the braking setup on the CX-9, we have a dual piston floating caliper design here on a disc rotor. It's something you definitely expect on a vehicle of this size. Now the rear brakes on the CX-5 again are pretty straightforward. We have a floating caliper design with a disc rotor. Now the parking brake is an electronically actuated unit where you have an electric motor here that's going to squeeze these pads together. Now the fuel tank underneath the vehicle is located on both sides. It is made of steel and it is protected by this cover on this side as well as on this side. It has to be split down the middle for the drive shaft. Now the EVAP canister is located closer to the front in the middle of the vehicle. Now if you need to access the fuel pump or filter you can get to it underneath the rear seats. However the manual actually specifies that you have to cut your own access in the carpet in order to reach that access panel. Now the steering setup on the CX-5 is really straightforward. It's just an electric power steering rack that sits on top of the subframe over here before going out to the tie rod. Now taking a look up underneath the dash, we have the electric power steering motor that connects to the steering column. Now overall, under the hood of the CX-9, I really like how things are laid out. It's pretty easy to work on. Everything is very simple. There's no complications like say a German brand or other turbocharged engines that have a lot of electronics and sensors or other things that could go wrong. I just hope that the reliability of this engine is going to be good as the naturally aspirated Skyactiv engine. Now I really like that Mazda's combined some really beautiful styling on the outside side with very traditional mechanicals on the inside such as a very simple suspension setup and a traditional six-speed automatic transmission. Now the CX-9 is made in Japan so it does stick true to its Japanese Mazda roots. If you are thinking of buying one of these just make sure you rust proof it and keep up on maintenance. Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next car review is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one. Oh crap.